Well, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. The talk uh, uh, title today is uh, Plastic Synapses in a Stable Brain. And uh, in this talk, I will give you a brief uh, outlook of uh, the most recent research uh, that I've been doing at the Department of Cognitive and Neurosystem at Boston University and at the Center of Excellence for Learning in Education, Science uh, and Technology, which is a consortium of university, including Boston University, MIT, and Brandeis uh, uh, University. So one of the major themes that uh, has interested me throughout my research, starting from the beginning of my PhD, is how do we learn stable memories? Uh, so how are memories uh, first formed and then consolidated and uh, kept, uh, uh, you know, more or less intact throughout uh, the lifespan of an organism? And this is a fairly important and difficult question, especially if you consider what kind of hardware uh, biological uh, organism have available uh, have at their disposal in order to store information. So a typical human brain has a uh, hundred uh, billion neurons, around a hundred billion neurons, about uh, 60 trillion synapses. And if you consider uh, a, an average lifespan of about two billion seconds, and uh, if we assume uh, with a very conservative estimate that each neuron in the brain emits about a spike every second, we are uh, facing about uh, 200 quadrillion spike which touch and uh, potentially modify in a plastic way uh, about a quintillion plastic synapses. So the question spontaneously arises on how our memory preserved despite uh, uh, all these uh, processing going on. And uh, what are synapses? Synapses are uh, connection uh, from neurons to other neurons. So here on the left uh, you can see a typical neuron which receives uh, uh, on the order of a few thousand synapses from other neurons. Uh, these uh, uh, cause either excitatory or uh, inhibitory postsynaptic potential, which then travel down to the axon, uh, through the, the dendrites to the um, uh, some of the neuron where they are integrated. And if they pass a critical threshold, they generate an action potential, which then travel down the soma, uh, down the axon to uh, affect the membrane pot potential of uh, other thousand neurons. Um, it is a fact that synapses undergo continuous changing uh, during learning episode, while at the same time they are uh, basically the substrate for the maintenance of uh, uh, long-term memory in humans. And this is a beautiful example uh, by Young et al. in 2009, where a rat uh, was monitored before and after, um, the brain of the rat was monitored before and after uh, a learning experiment in which, which involved learning a new motor task. So the, the, the task was uh, uh, rotating, uh, running in a, in a rotating rod, which is a fairly difficult task for the, for the mouse. And if you image this, the uh, motor cortex, which is the uh, part of the cerebral cortex which will be modified in a plastic way by such a task, you notice that uh, along with the maintenance and the uh, uh, sculpting and modification of pre-existing synapses, you also notice the generation of new, uh, of new uh, synaptic bu buttons. And if you do a cartoon of uh, what happens to the synapses of an organism throughout its uh, adult life, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, its beginning to, uh, uh, to, a, to, to uh, an old organism, you can see that at the beginning you start with a lot of synapses which are then pruned by development fairly quickly. Uh, and you, you can notice that novel um, uh, learning episodes cause the uh, appearance of new synapses which, uh, in, you know, in a matter of days, uh, some of them are lost, but some others are preserved, which then constitute a permanent memory uh, for, the, for the lifespan of the organism. And the collection of these memories constitute what is a normal, what is, what is the, you know, the, the usual baggage of knowledge or the usual memory system of an adult uh, individual. This is a, a very important problem, not only for neuroscience, so understanding how are these memories generated and, and maintained, but also for technological applications. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, effort has been put in the past uh, 20 years uh, to try to capture the uh, architecture and the functionality of a uh, uh, distributed system based on, uh, on, on brain mechanism. Uh, but uh, the problem with, co with this connection in network is that the, the brain does not exhibit anything like a, a catastrophic interference, which is seen widely in this type of, uh, of architecture. Uh, catastrophic interference is basically a phenomenon uh, through which uh, the incorporation of new memory uh, cancels or depletes or the, uh, degrades the progressively uh, s memory that have already been stored. 
Uh, and this, uh, solving this problem is not only important for understanding how the brain works, but also for uh, inco uh, from realizing smarter chips that, that are able to learn uh, throughout the life of, uh, of the chip while do not uh, destroy completely what they've been learning, for instance, in a, you know, at, the, at the very beginning of the imprinting of the circuit. So in other words, how do cells in the developing or adult brain coordinate their activity and consistently learn uh, the organism behavioral goal? Or, uh, uh, moreover, how does learning give rise to the neural architecture that supports information processing, attention, and uh, specialized bra brain functions such as uh, visual perception? Uh, and also, how do neurons modify their synaptic connection without having a very precise or a very uh, direct ac access to the behavioral goal of the organism? So how do neurons modify their connection without knowing if the organism is right or wrong? In other words, what neural architecture can support stable learning and information processing in the brain? Uh, and uh, we have to keep in mind that unlike uh, von Neumann machine, brains are the memory of the system, which is also the algorithm. So if we look at the brain, and if we look, at, for instance, at the, one of the most important pathway or most studied pathway uh, of, of uh, uh, information processing in the brain, which is the visual system, we notice right away that, yes, there is a lot of information that uh, flows uh, in a feed-forward fashion from uh, the eye, for instance, the, the retina, to the thalamus uh, or the lo lo uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, which is uh, the section of the thalamic nucleus that projects to the cerebral cortex, uh, to, to the visual cortex, and then, you know, to the visual cortex, but for each fiber that reaches the visual cortex from the thalamus, there are about 10 times more fiber leaving the cerebral cortex and reaching the thalamus. And the, the, the natural question that arises is, what is this feedback for? Well, we can uh, start thinking about what is feedback uh, for if we start thinking, uh, if, we, if we do, for instance, a thought experiment. Um, let's imagine that uh, some of you this morning decided to come uh, and listen to this talk. You were uh, sitting at your desk, you decided to come. Uh, you stand up, leave your desk, walk through the corridor, and uh, uh, come to the conference room, open the door, find a seat as close as possible to the door, and, uh, and sit down. So this can be thought about a fairly feed-forward uh, flow of information and planning. But uh, my argument would be that uh, there is as much feedback processing in, uh, uh, in, uh, in what you're doing, what everybody has done this morning, as much there is a feed-forward flow of information. And this can be fairly easily seen if we start looking at ways in which uh, we can manipulate our environment. So, Let's imagine, for instance, that somebody left uh, a yellow piece of paper on your desk uh, yesterday night, a yellow post-it. You will notice right away, as well, you can uh, fairly uh, easily identify if somebody played a trick on you and uh, uh, change uh, very slightly, say, uh, half a centimeter, the height of your desk, such as the angle of your elbow, uh, which is usually uh, a certain angle, uh, has been, has, uh, is a little wider than usual or somebody has started to uh, spray the corridor uh, with Chanel number no. 5, uh, assuming that Chanel number no. 5 is, of course, not the usual uh, smell of uh, Qualcomm corridors, or somebody has changed the microphone in the auditorium or changed the doorknob such that it has a different uh, texture or uh, a different size. Um, and this happens because at every moment, what you're doing, you're matching memory-based expectation with sensory and other cortical uh, input. Uh, another example of how feedback uh, operates is uh, uh, its ability to not only to pinpoint if there has been a change in the environment, but also rapidly allocate attentional resources towards the, the, the part of the environment which are critical in, this, in the changed uh, information with respect to the expectation. So if I prime you to expect a picture of the, the President of the United States to appear on the screen, and then I present this picture, you will not only uh, rapidly realize that something is wrong, but you will also direct your attention towards uh, the critical part of the stimulation which presents, uh, uh, w which are most likely carrying the uh, most important discriminator discriminatory information to make uh, the assessment of what is actually uh, going on. So you don't only match memory with your current uh, expectation, but you also focus on cri critical uh, differences. Uh, another beautiful example is uh, in the domain of uh, uh, um, language. Uh, this process does not go on only in vision, of course, it, go on, it goes on ubiquitously uh, in the brain. So let's imagine that uh, I give